Welcome to the XY Advisor podcast. To join a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice, head to xyadvisor.com. G'day, g'day. How's it going? Clayton here with the CEO of the AFA, Phil Kewen. Mate, how's things? Hey, Clayton. I'm well, thanks. How are you? Very good, very good. Um, I'm pretty excited to have you here. It's always great to have the AFA um, on the XY podcast. And there's obviously, I like everything in financial services, there's a lot going on right now, but um, it's great to grab a little bit of your time to discuss some of the more, I guess, pressing things. One of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is APRA last year came out and said that the sustainability of the life insurance um, industry as a whole is basically non-existent and all the insurance companies have been fighting to give, you know, extra benefits so that they turn up higher in the recommended list on X plan, but they've pushed it so far and advisors, I've got to say, have done such a great job of claiming for their clients that um, it's tipped everything into unsustainability as far as I can tell. And um, so APRA came out and said, all right, none of the, you know, enough of this. We're getting rid of a bunch of things. We're, we're pulling the, the benefits back and the costs have to go up. Um, you know, from a, from a utilitarian point of view, high level, I get why that's happened. Uh, I think, you know, it's better having a life insurance industry rather than not. And, um, but at the same time, that's true. A lot, a lot, yeah, that true. <laughs> the, the, uh, a lot of, a lot of the sort of the, the flack, I guess you could say, um, has fallen at the hands of advisors. Do you think, um, you know, do you think, I guess, APRA and the industry needs to do a better job of helping advisors educate their clients or like, or, or how do you think advisors should handle the conversations you know, moving forward with their clients? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question and it's a topical issue. Uh, can I just go back to your intro though? I think you, you've underplayed the fact that there's a lot going on at the moment. I mean, I, I, I thought last year was a challenge and then I thought the year before that was a challenge. Um, the challenges that we're facing right now um, uh, are unbelievable. I'm not going to say unprecedented because... Uh, I know that that's been uh, been overused, uh, but um, but I, I've I've never seen um, the state of the industry as such at the moment, and, and in in doing so, we're seeing sort of some of the best, um, mostly some of the best, uh, and and obviously some bad things come out of it as well. But mostly, I think we're seeing the best in in a lot of parties in in advisors, uh, in what they do, um, really coming to the fore and helping their clients at a time of uncertainty. Um, but we're seeing, you know, it's really great to see just a lot of good intent and cooperation at all levels of government, regulators, uh, associations uh, and advisors. Everyone just want to get the best outcome. So I think, you know, it is an unusual time, a um, lot of challenges, but a lot of people are working together to try and get the best outcome. So having said that, yep. um, I know you asked a specific question about the um, about income protection. And look, this is... This is obviously, you know, it sort of was a bit of a sleeper just before Christmas. Uh, a lot of advisors didn't see the announcement from APRA. It did, it did highlight a really interesting thing. Uh, you know, I've had more to do with APRA in the last uh, three, four months than I have probably in the last three or four years. Yeah. And, and, and it highlighted the fact that there's no direct line of communication between APRA um, and advisors. Um, mm. their, their responsibilities to the responsible entities, so the, the life insurers, and they're the ones that they communicate with. Um, and so advisors you know, and clients are, are obviously part of the, 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 the cycle, um, but not, not part of the direct communication. And I think that's been part of our challenge insofar as that this issue and income protection has been building and building and building for some time. Um, advisors have done what their job is to do and that is to deliver the best cover they can for their clients and continue to review those contracts and ensure that their clients are in the best position available and that's what they've been doing behind the scenes um, there's been a lot of concern about the increasing 
claims, uh, the duration of the claims and the size of the claims, and obviously that's having an impact on profitability. APRA, you know, through a few um, warning shots over the bow of the insurers um, over the last couple of years, concerned about it. And um, because of the competitive environment that we are in, I mean, we are in one of the most sophisticated uh, advisor markets in the world, uh, and advisors know um, what they should be giving their, their clients. And so the competition has been such that they're continuing to offer their clients the most competitive products. And that's their job. The current challenge is those products, as we've seen, are no longer profitable. Uh, and it's been an amazing challenge over the last couple of years for advisors just to retain uh, business, uh, talking to clients through the, the continuous and sustained premium increases on income protection. And so advisors recognise that that's, that's not sustainable either. So everyone, I think, you know, the average advisor understands that what we need is a sustainable product with consistent pricing and certainty. And so I think we're going to head into that. It's just the period of transition where there's a great deal of uncertainty um, is what's creating uh, the most concern at the moment. Yeah. It's, when I think about it, I think um, it's almost like, the advisors beat the house. It's almost like the advisors are, are, uh, are card counters and we've sat at the blackjack table and we figured it out and we claimed so successfully uh, for so long that we bankrupted the house, almost. Almost to the point that the reinsurers were looking at this thing going, no, I'm not sure if I'm willing to, to take the risk. I am actually glad that ASIC from a top-down point of view uh, tackled it head on because undoubtedly behind the scenes, the insurance companies would have been sweating bullets um, for the last few years. And to, to, I can't quote the losses off the top of my head, but they were astronomical. Um, and having uh, an industry that people can turn up to day in, day out and deliver value to their clients is so important that, um, I mean, I take my, on one hand, I definitely take my hat off to the advisors who, got the best and delivered the best to their clients um, and broke the bank, so to speak. And, but now we've kind of, you know, okay, congratulations. You know, you won, but you, you actually, you want it to be sustainable. So um, yeah, it's, it's an, it's, I mean, if I, if I put my advisor hat on, I go, ah, you know, like it's tough because the conversations I'm telling client a that, you know, the price of this, you know, level premium is, is X and we can expect this over the next few years. And yet now I've got to keep going back to them almost year after year after year and talk to them as if it's a stepped policy. And, um, and that obviously, you know, has its own, so, so it's almost like the, um, the, the person that suffers the consequences, the, is the advisor having the conversation with the client, which is just a massive shame. Um, at, but at the end of the day, I, I think there should be yeah. more done by APRA as, and you, you sort, sort of um, identified that whole more done by APRA to say, actually advisors, you know, uh, I, I realize we put a press release out on, as you mentioned before, a sleeper at the end of the year in amongst everything else that was going on. Um, but yeah, and don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not implying that that was done intentionally. No. Uh, to, uh, no, to, God to, no. To, 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 you know, it's not like putting the, uh, you know, as the, as the government might say, putting the rubbish out on a, on a Friday night. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> no, absolutely. They, is, they probably weren't but, even um, thinking about that at all. No, Ap APRA's, and that's, that's exactly it. APRA's, um, you know, sole purpose is to ensure that the, there's financial stability in the institutions that are making promises to, to the customers that clients are also making promises to. And so yeah. that's, that's their job. I completely understand that. I just want to be careful though, because you've talked about advisors beating the house. I mean, advisors role is to provide the best cover. Yes. The most suitable cover to their clients. Yes. Now, whether that's the cheapest or whether that's, you know, the most comprehensive, but more expensive, mm -hmm. um, that is based on the needs of the client. So the advisors have been offering the cover that is most suitable to their clients. Yes. And they're the contracts that are on, on the market. Yeah. As, as you no, say, no. though, the, the challenge is the contracts on the market 
were no longer Too profitable. And, and, as, <laughs> and as you also said, no one wanted to be the first mover. You know, imagine no. being the insurer to say, look, guys, I know that um, I know you can get this cover 30% cheaper somewhere else, but ours is a responsible contract, so tell your client to come here. I mean, it's, yeah, that's, it's an impossible sale. So yes, yes, the insurer is needed, um, APRA to come out with the announcement, um, but it's not to say that it hasn't been difficult. And particularly uh, the, the strongest feedback I've had um, is around agreed value mm. and obviously around level premiums on existing business, mm. um, which has been a real uh, challenging issue for many advisors. Uh, and agreed yeah. value is what APRA would argue defies the, the laws of indemnity um, yep. And apart from New Zealand, we are the only market that, that offers a great value. Um, now, now, we would argue that you could have a great value, you just have set limits. Uh, yep. But the, the, my feedback in talking to all of the insurers uh, and, and APRA and other stakeholders is that a great value is just not sustainable in any shape or form going forward. Yeah, because the last thing, and, and this is a really interesting angle, if, if advisor's job is to is to do everything in the best interest of their clients. Yep. You're in a really awkward position as an advisor because what if your advisor gets paid, sorry, your advisor, your client gets paid more money by being on insurance claim than if they'd gone back to work. Yep. Oh, that's a tricky one, right? So now what's in the best interest of the client is the best interest of the client to become a constructive contributing, you know, purpose driven member of society where they're, where they're, you know, they're doing things and they're, you know, they're they're active or is it to lay on the couch and watch Netflix, but make more money. That is a super tricky point of view because one way would be to look at it. I mean, you know, I don't want to interpret the law incorrectly, but one interpretation could be, well, you've put your client in a worse financial situation by suggesting they get back to work. So you're not operating the best interest of your client. The other is, well, we pretty much know that if someone's on claim for more than sort of, especially five years, then they just, the, the, just the, the cascading effects to their mental health is worse and the cascading effects to their physical health is worse. And it, it's almost like they're, they're between a rock and a hard place. So I kind of understand if, if, if the industry can work its way from, you know, in any environment for the client being in technically a better in situation by not working, we've, we've got it. We've just got to move away from that, from a society and from an individual best interest to the client to get them becoming a contributing member of society again. The, the best, yeah, and we've seen this with some of the, the, you know, the initiatives the government's introduced in the current situation. I mean, the best cohabitation of insurance is with clients is the fact that if they are unable to work, then their income protection will replace them, their income because they're unable to work and provide an incentive where possible to help them return to work. And as mm-hmm. you say, return to be a productive um, part of the workforce, uh, to be a productive part of their family, society, have self-esteem and re- retain their health. Yep. Um, the reality is, though, sometimes that can't happen. And for some people in an indemnity contract, um, but depending on how their business was in the year or two before they went on claim, uh, they may actually have paid 10 years premiums, um, and, but because of a downturn in income or because of taking maternity leave or something, um, they may not necessarily be able to receive a benefit that they've been paying for for many years. And they're, they're sort of the things we've been arguing. We made a, a, a joint submission from the Joint Association's Life Insurance Task Force that's the AFA and F- FPA combined, and members, uh, advisors from both of those, and we, we made a submission to APRA um, along those lines, ensuring that pre-disability income was recognised for people who um, uh, you know, have had job interruptions, um, have fluctuations in income, particularly self-employed small business operators whose income fluctuates uh, to ensure that their pre-disability income uh, you know, reflects the average over the last few years, not necessarily... Uh, just when they, when they were not claim. 
Yeah, no, hands down. Um, pivoting just slightly into the FASIA exam. Um, yeah. I know you guys have been doing a little bit of work on, with it, you know, with COVID, the pandemic, the you know, in-person exams are sort of, you know, out of vogue at the moment, obviously. Um, yeah. Online exams are all the rage. Um, and then there's extension. So there's actually quite, kind of two little topics I wanted to cover. Um, what's going on with online exams and has the, um, is there an extension? So I guess answering the second first. So when you're talking about the extension, so the legislation to extend the exam date and the degree date, yep. um, we know that the, the legislation for those extensions passed through the lower house. Unfortunately, it did not go through uh, the upper house um, before Parliament um, was ceased um, mm. and deferred until August, um, which is unfortunate because uh, you know our understanding is both um, you know the government and the opposition are supportive of those extensions. Uh, we know that uh, many MPs on both sides uh, and um, the um, opposition uh, spokesperson Stephen Jones has received personal uh, visits from advisors. Uh, expressing the need for those extensions and they want to support them. The government has said to us that the extensions will pass this year. Uh, We've also contacted Stephen Jones' office from the opposition and they have said that they will support the extensions this year. Uh, However, that's great, but if we have to wait till August, um, that doesn't leave much time. You know, if something further happens, is unpredictable, um, yeah, you know, I, I trust implicitly what is being said in the right intent, um, but we have suggested, you know, that there could be um, means by regulation uh, where those extensions can be put through if there is further delay. But, you know, I, I would suggest everyone work on the basis that those extensions will go ahead. In terms of the online exam, you said they're all the rage. Um, <laughs> not sure if, I'm not sure if they're all the rage. Uh, I mean, FASIA has a job to do. FASIA yes. has to work to the, the, the guidelines, the legal, you know, the legal time frame. Yep. It's not, it's not FASIA's job to change the rules if the, uh, you know, if those extensions haven't gone through. Yep. Uh, obviously, you can't have um, face-to-face exams or exams on mass. So they've done their best to deliver an online exam. Um, It has had an impact. I mean, the last sitting of the 2,200 um, students who enrolled, I believe, um, talking to Stephen Glenfield yesterday, only about 500 sat that exam. Um, Mm. Many pulled out because they just didn't have time to adapt to the different uh, different way of doing it. Gotcha. Um, And, you know, it seemed to be very complicated. Uh, You know, you had to have a specific setup you had to be supervised you had to have a mirror your camera um, and a lot of advisors uh, were just not sure how that would work for them Um, I know FASIA is doing its best to uh, try and improve the situation whilst at the same time as making sure it is still a fully supervised exam is there a one pager I actually haven't seen the, the specific instructions is there like an infographic or something to make it easy as to um, what's required? I, I believe you, you get the information once you've enrolled for the exam. And this is what we talked about with FASI yesterday, the fact that it would, um, you know, FASI is conscious, firstly, that, that um, you know, their priorities and what's happening um, in advisors' worlds at the moment, uh, you know, the priorities are sort of um, uh, realigned somewhat. And so they don't want to be coming out with, uh, more information about code of ethics and things like that at the moment, if it's not necessary. Yeah. However, our conversation did recognise the fact that more clarity around the exams for those people who do want to sit it would be worthwhile. The fact that yeah. they are offering to help people beforehand to test their setup to make sure, because some people are concerned their computer's not appropriate or they don't have yep. the bandwidth. Um, yep. So uh, they will, in working with ASA, um, who's, um, who's running the exam, uh, enable people to do a test beforehand uh, and provide the information that you get when you enrol prior to that so that people can get a sense of yeah. what it actually entails rather than enrol first and, oh, now this is what I need to do. And that's, that's what frightened people <laughs> off when they were told, you know, you, you might, have to, might have to disable your firewalls, 
um, you know, yeah. that obviously sent, you know, large institutionally based licensees into a spin because, um, you, you know, you, you just don't disable firewalls. Now, our understanding is no one had to do that uh, for okay. the last exam. And these are, these are the messages that Foresee wants to get out um, to encourage more people. If they do want to do it online, um, that they can do that. What would be, yeah, it'd be um, awesome. I should touch base with uh, Stephen. Um, we, yeah, it'd be really good to get that information out just to make sure. I, it's, it's always, I mean, you always want as much information as possible, right? It's just human nature to know, okay, this yep. is the thing that I have to do now. Uh, okay, I got to set up a mirror. Okay, that's weird. Um, you know, okay, I've got to put it here. Okay. But you know, honey, do we have a mirror? <laughs> right. It's like, it's like, you know, you just You've already got your setup, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, uh, you know, where, where are you just going to, you might have to go buy a mirror for goodness sake. Like you never, you never stuff like that. You, you kind of want to going to know, you know, well ahead of time. Um, yeah. So. And that, and that was exactly the thing. It was just too much too soon for people, yeah. but in fairness, um, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm sort of, you know, a, a mouthpiece for C. I I mean, in fairness, there wasn't much choice. Um, yeah. They can't just cancel the exams sure. um, because legally at the moment uh, they know that they're obliged to have those exams so that people can sit them. Yep. Um, and right. so they're, do they're doing their best to, to make sure that people can actually sit the exams if they want. Yeah, yeah. No, it makes, uh, makes sense. Um yeah, actually, touching on the rules and regulations, um, because I was just sitting there thinking about that, you know, for C is, I guess, a little bit more bound in legislation to their, their scope and what they can do and they can't do. And a pandemic, not even a pandemic really changes anything for them. Um, unless it's, of course, written in the legislation that in the event of a pandemic, uh, <laughs> you're allowed to make and, the changes. Uh, and I'll tell you what, there's a number of contracts I've been looking for that wording. I can tell you. <laughs> exactly I think right. we've all had to, we're all approaching things very differently than how yeah. we used to. That's so funny. It's so true, though. Um, but there, I would imagine that there are aspects um, maybe not for SEER, but maybe other other parts of the rules and regulations that, um, and I know you guys have been doing a little bit of work in trying to make life a bit easier for advisors because, you know, as we started this podcast, every year just seems to be insanely more difficult than the last. And what used to be, you know, an unbelievable event is now last week's news because we're dealing with something else. And so, um, but those things don't go away, right? And they sort of just keep on adding up and adding up and adding up. And um, ha have, you, have you guys at the AFA had any luck in terms of being able to put arguments forward and r asking to make things a little bit easier considering, you know, did, going through the contracts, did you see the word pandemic? And did, did, what did you find to be able to sort of say, hey, wait a second, wind this back a little bit because uh, everything is happening at once and then all of a sudden you know, people are dropping dead left, right and center. So we need to sort of give people some breathing room. What, what have you guys come up with? Yeah, uh, there's a lot in that. I mean, for starters, even before uh, COVID-19, you know, we were already talking to, to the government and the regulators about trying to remove red tape. I mean, we know there was a timeline for the, the Royal Commission recommendations. Um, and I guess if, if one of the good things to come out of the current situation is that you know, a lot of the, the timeline for, for different things um, uh, is being reviewed. Uh, but, of course, that's something that we do want to make sure uh, we get some certainty as to, to what that revised timeline looks like. But at the moment, the key thing for, for advisors is the fact that um, you've got clients, you know, particularly clients, uh, retirees, pre-retirees, in a heightened sense of, of panic about their superannuation, uh, their investments, uh, they're wanting to talk to advisors and, and they need to do it in a timely manner uh, and advisors need to talk to as many clients as possible. Uh, and, and that is one thing that's happening. A lot of advisors have been, you can, you can get this sense of being invigorated by the fact that they're really showing their purpose now at the moment because they're helping their clients to settle down, calm them in, in a very uncertain environment, at least with their investments. Mm. But... 
Um, it does mean that you know, some of the current rules uh, are a bit restrictive. Uh, and that's why we have been talking to the government and the regulators about some, some measures to try and, uh, and relieve that. And we, we saw some announcements early this week, which are, are common sense uh, announcements around, you know, the flexibility around the use of a record of advice. Um, you know, the fact that um, you could have people in a different licensee uh, to see the client and use a record of advice, which makes sense. So if an advisor is away or, or too busy with other clients, uh, they can do that. And, you know, extension of the deadline for provision of critical time critical advice from five days to 30 days just makes sense. In the current environment where there's a lot more people talking to their advisor and advisors can't actually see people face to face. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, they, they make sense. Some of the other things that we've suggested is, you know, uh, allowing clients up to 90 days to sign opt-in notices rather than 30 days. Um, that, would, that would make sense. Um, going forward, uh, simply because it's it's just harder for advisors to see clients, you know, face to face, and yeah, you know, simple things like being able to uh, verify uh, documents um, online uh, through video means or something, uh, rather than you know face to face, you know, witnessing and, and JP witnessing, etc. That, that you've just touched on probably, I would say, the number one spoken about issue on XY at the moment is wet signatures. Yeah. And that appears to be, to my mind, I know some emergency measures have been brought in, but I'm, I'm, uh, it seems like some of the products aren't um, keeping up with that. So the product, yeah. e- e- even if, you know, the wet signatures aren't necessary for the next 30 days or whatever it is. I, I haven't looked in depth at it, but um, I know some of the people have been saying, well, you know, whatever the rule is or re- whatever the, um, the, the softening of that rule is, there's a lot of, there's a lot of products out there that aren't listening to that. So they still require it internally. It seems, I, I, I mean, can you guys do anything with that? It just, it seems um, really difficult, I'd imagine, to get a private company. Let's, you know, I don't want to name any of them because uh, I don't know which ones are and aren't, but it's a very big companies out there. Um, and is that, is that something, you know, the AFA can walk up to, the, you know, the, the big companies and, and say, hey, um, you're making life pretty difficult for advisors. Can you, can you chill out a bit? We've done what we're doing with a number of the issues that are coming up and we talk to the product providers all the time. If something comes up that uh, it comes up regularly through our members um, and I will encourage um, anyone out there to give us, you know, feedback on any of the challenges uh, because we're continually to continuing to sort of gather a list um, and, but importantly make solutions. Um, So if, if it's a product provider, that's really coming up now as being a differentiator in the marketplace and people are, are, are really sort of looking at the product providers that are making it more difficult. I know talking to some of them behind the scenes, they're rapidly trying to uh, improve their processes Yeah. Uh, because what was a nice to have in a normal environment is now critical. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's amazing how sometimes, you know, things that you don't think are that important uh, become extremely important. Um, yeah. And so from a product provider point of view, uh, advisors are letting them know as well as we are, loud and clear, um, where, you know, if one provider can do it and the other one can't, um, it's, it, it will tell for, uh, you know, for some time because advisors will make a choice as to, you know, their recommendations going forward. Um, in terms of legislation, um, if by law you're required to get, um, you know, signatures or, or you know, face-to-face identification. You can't actually do that at the moment, but we need some relaxation uh, so that you, you know, that, that they can actually get the verification necessary uh, without having face-to-face witnessing. Yeah, I, someone was saying um, maybe making a list, a public list of the companies that uh, are forcing you to still take um, wet signatures you know, so that there's a bit of a landing page for advisors to go to and say, okay, well, which ones, <laughs> which ones are dead ends right now? Because it, it's not like, you know, with this, everything that's going on, I mean, some advisors are having to put on more staff and because of the amount of insurance claims that are not so much claims, sorry, but insurance work 
uh, new yep. insurance. Um, and so it's not like because of this less work is going on, but if all of a sudden you're bashing your head up against a wall because a company wants to, um, uh, you know, have wet signatures, then that's, I mean, that's going to be such an insanely uh, unavoidable problem for the advisor um, mm. that there needs, you know, it might be, might be not a bad idea to have some sort of landing page where, um, you know, it, once the, once the company has said we're good to go with digital signature, then, you know, they, uh, they go on the landing page, uh, you know, just as not that you guys aren't doing anything else, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, uh, even before all this, we, uh, I'm forever getting uh, you should name and shame this company because they didn't pay this claim or you should name and shame this company because they don't offer this online facility that this company does. Uh, we are in an open marketplace. Uh, it is a competitive environment. Um, and companies will, um, you know, they'll they'll succeed or or not based mm. on what they can provide. However, there are times when you know you need to have maybe some government influence, yeah, um, or um, some sort of unified approach. Um, yeah, and if I can give an example of of where um, you know we've asked for a unified approach is that you know. We would like, at the moment, there are people who have been stood down and are not receiving an income. And we know the government's done a great job in providing some stimulus, but it, it doesn't necessarily replace everyone's income. Yeah. So insurance premiums, at the moment, some people cannot afford to pay their insurance premiums. Mm -hmm. um, what we would like to see is a consistent approach across the board. Because what you're talking about, you know, we can't sort of now take how an insurance company is dealing with uh, premium payments and choose whether or not we deal with that company yeah. because it's it's at the wrong time. Yeah, uh, they're already loyal clients. All all we would like to see is some consistency, so advisors don't have to, on a case by case basis, um, go to the insurers, and this would save the insurers time as well. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of effort in, in having to negotiate each time whether a client deserves to have their, you know, their premiums, um, a premium holiday. I know there are different contracts. Um, some contracts provide premium holidays, provisions. Some do so without cover. Uh, some do so with cover. So it's a bit of a minefield. Uh, I think that's a perfect example where perhaps as an industry, and I have talked to the insurers and the FSC about this, um, as an industry, there can be a, a consistent approach so that the general public doesn't lose trust um, in, a, in a, an industry um, at a critical time. Mm. Um, here's a question that I think you and very few people would be able to answer. And that is, what do politicians think of advisors and about the advice industry as a whole? Because are they looking at you know, obviously we're, we're in an environment that's not the result of the, the incumbent politicians, right? Mm -hmm. It's, 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 yep. it's not that the, the, just because you're the treasurer, everything is your fault. No, it's like you, you, you're, you're in that position and every decision that's ever come before you, um, you're living in the repercussions of. And yep. so advice is that I just don't know a better word to use. It's just been uh, the, the professional whipping boy for the last few years. And, and yep. I, I, I do people in government realise that? Uh, the short answer, I would say, is yes. Um, okay. If you're saying, do they realise that advisors have been subject to an inordinate amount of um, scrutiny, pressure, regulatory change over the last couple of years? You know, I said at our roadshow at the beginning of this year, and I'm glad we got the roadshow in before, <laughs> yeah, well done. before the doors got shut. Um that I thought we'd turn the corner. Um, we know the government had a roadmap to get the Royal Commission recommendations in, but outside of that, there seemed to be a, a commitment um, to look at the reform um, and to look at ensuring that advisors could actually conduct their business uh, profitably mm -hmm. and be able to give affordable advice uh, to more people because They've met more advisors. This is a critical thing. I'd love to say it's all because of the work of you know the AFA and um, you know myself and Phil Anderson and and other you know associations. Um, 
a lot of the influence comes from advisors and it comes from advisors who have visited their local members. Mm. And the time that we can have the most impact is if I can walk into um, a minister and they have met with, you know, their constituents um, who have explained to them what their challenges are, but importantly, what the solutions are. Because one of the feedback, uh, you know, the strongest feedback I got initially from politicians was that we get a lot of advisors come to us, but they only come to us with problems. Yeah. Um, we need, we need, we need solutions. So the key thing is we've seen a lot more advisors visit their local members, explain to them, you know, what, you know, how, what their business is, how many people they employ, how many clients they look after, what sort of things they do for their clients. Um, but also explain to them and, and physically shown them the wads of paper that they have to deliver a client. And we, you know, we, um, you know, we did that recently, and we got some great supporters um, in the government. You know, Bert Van Manen, who's um, a strong, long been an advocate for advisors. Uh, Amanda Stoker more recently, and the, they've, uh, uh, ex- as well as Senator Jane Hume, I, I must say, who's been, um, you know, since she's come on board. Um, you know, Stuart Robert was very engaging, but Jane uh, has taken it up another level and she really recognises uh, the challenges, the important role that advisors have, but the important responsibility as well. Uh, but they've all looked for practical examples of what the challenges are for advisors, what they do for their clients. Uh, and they're very keen to continue to work with us to get, um, you know, to improve the situation um, so that, you know, we, we can remove red tape uh, and we do get rid of all the bad apples so that we can't be used as the whipping boy that you talk about mm. uh, because they can only go on the, the bad examples that people throw up at them or the, the referred examples, and they're getting less and less, even though the scrutiny has been greater because whenever there's more scrutiny, you're going to see the bad examples. Absolutely. But the numbers, the numbers are less and less. I always come back to, um, so for example, I was having a really good conversation with someone that works in safety and the conversations that, that go on in safety land, right? Which, which are the, the best way I could describe it is, do you remember the, um, do you remember the movie Fight Club? I remember it. I don't, yeah. I don't know if I actually saw it. Oh, man, it's such a good film. You definitely got to check it out. So um, so fight, there's a part in Fight Club where, you know, uh, the calculation, Edward Norton's character is trying to figure out the calculation of um, what it will cost to if they get sued by, um, you know, by, by people or, yeah. or what, what's the cost is if they recall the product, right? And then mm. if, if the cost is more to um to to get sued then they recall the product you know it's a fictional it's a fictional story but the illustration i think is really true and that is what business up that operates what I, I just can't i can't think of an industry that operates with such piety that uh nothing can ever go wrong and the, the reason I bring this up is, uh, mm. so a, a good mate of mine speaking to him yesterday, he's a school teacher, another really mm. good example. And he's, yeah. he's teaching his class while, you know, laying on the couch in his tracker dacks, right? So this is the story that he's telling me. And yeah. I, go, I go, why is it that every other industry can rely on the, the human nature in all the good and the bad that comes with it, but financial advice is held to a standard that is so high. And, and I've got to be really particular with my words here because I'm not excusing any bad behavior. Mm-hmm. But, but what I'm saying is I feel like it feels like the goal of the investigation into financial advice is attempting to eradicate imperfections found in people like literally trying to erase and rub out any kind of um, poor decision-making. And, and like from a, from a theoretical, from a philosophical point of view, I love it, right? I love it. I think it's great. Mm. Uh, I just feel like 
advice has been singled out as almost like the tip of the spear and said, well, actually what we're aiming for here is something that no other profession, no other, uh, no other occupation can achieve. And that is um, that no bad thing will ever go on ever. And the reason I'm saying all this is because, I, like everyone else in financial advice, would love Mm. if every horrible advisor was permanently eradicated and it never again attracted another bad advisor. Like, I would love that. And in fact, it would make my life. Yeah, absolutely. But I know for a fact that next year and the year after and the year after and every single year, there's going to be unscrupulous people that become financial planners and find ways to screw over clients. And I hate that that's true, but it is true. But the true, the, but, but the exact reality is that's happening in every single profession, in every yep. single industry. And you cannot rub out people doing the wrong thing altogether. And I just feel like, a lot of this stuff that's happening is we're attempting, we've just picked financial planning and we've gone, okay, now we're going to do everything we can to ensure that no one could ever be, make a poor decision ever again. And it's like, well, you can only go so far and not because I want people to find the cracks in the system, but if you push it to the point that people who aren't like that, which is the overwhelming majority, can't operate successfully, profitably, and enjoy their work, then what you're going to end up with is either no industry mm. or, or a bunch of people that, as we've seen, are going through such a hard time that, that they're not surviving it. And yep. uh, like I'm, I am so like, I guess I'm probably emotionally attached to this because um, Someone, you know, someone in X, Y, like uh, they recently committed suicide. And I'm just going, is the pursuit of rubbing out anything that can possibly go wrong at the expense of making everyone's life really difficult? Is it worth it? Is the cure better than the problem? And I just, I'm not convinced right now with every single thing that's gone on for so long that we're at the right place. I feel like we've gone too far and I'm glad that the pol- pol- the politicians know that. I just, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and look, that is, that is a conversation that I've had a, a number of times um, with a number of politicians and, and, and you have to be really careful because mm. every industry goes into Canberra and says the sky is falling um, and right. says if if you don't do this then the industry is going to fail um, if you don't do this then we won't vote for you uh, and so you have to be careful because everyone's coming in with the same message uh, I do as I said believe earlier that the government has recognized that in some areas it's gone too far now I, I, in in what you were saying I think we're in, in agreement that no one uh, is uh, objecting to the fact that we're on a path to professionalism mm. that will get us to a standing with the government, with the consumer, where there are no more excuses. Mm. Um, if, if the government at the moment can be accused by the opposition of having a structure in place that allows imperfections to manifest through institutions, then it's going to be held to account. And so that's the process we're going through. What we just didn't expect, particularly post-Royal Commissions, what we thought was institutional malaise, we didn't expect that the human toll at an advisor level was going to be so great because it just just followed through and the impact that it's having, whether it's 515 lookbacks on on advisors and institutional licensees, increasing PI costs, um, increased scrutiny. um, You know, there's there's any number of things that are impacting advisors. Um, we just didn't expect it to happen at such a, at such a human level. The good thing to come out of this is hopefully firstly that we will retain a lot of the experienced advisors that we want to retain. If we approach, you know, approach this pragmatically, that's why there's the exam extensions. Uh, that's why there's been more flexibility uh, granted at the moment. Um, but we also take the heat off and that's why we can then start to argue more things like 
making financial advice tax deductible, uh, making it part and parcel of uh, you know our daily um, you know our daily lives as opposed to this satellite industry that's tacked onto a massive you know financial services bubble yeah. that obviously has a lot of scrutiny because it's got people's life savings and it has a compulsory superannuation environment. That's that's always going to mean that there's going to be closer scrutiny because you've got a compulsory superannuation and therefore you've always got people thinking that that's a gravy train for people to try and pick up and and profiteer from. Yep. Um, And that's, you know, people will always have, even if that's not happening, there will always be people who throw those accusations. But I I do believe the light at the end of the tunnel is the fact that we will be considered to be the profession we deserve to. The passionate advisors who, like you, like you were talking about, they believe in themselves. And one of the one of the disappointing things for advisors over the last few years is the fact that the feeling that other than their clients, you know, no one believed in the good of what they did. You know, because when you have a royal commission or a government saying that you know this needs to be cleaned up, um, that has an impact on on them and their self esteem. Uh, but they know. And that's why, you know, I've seen advisors who have been re-energised in the current environment, their clients need them and they value them. And that's what keeps them going. That's what keeps them, you know, wanting to, to get up every day and continue to do that and run their businesses. Yeah. And which is, which is why that, that little snarky comment in the Choice magazine was really <laughs> yeah. annoying. Um, just totally. It was, it was really but, annoying for a number of reasons. Yeah, it was... I mean, Inappropriate and totally unneeded and kind of like a high school 14 year old, you know, just like trying to jab in a little elbow for no reason, completely off. It just looked off script. It looked added in. Um, yeah. Weird. I I don't see the, I don't see the benefit in such a comment. Uh, I said at the outset, one of the positives about the current environment is everyone is working together to get the right outcome. Um, Comments like that are just unhelpful. We want people to feel assured. We want people to know that they can talk to people in a mm. time when they're making financial decisions. They don't want bits of information saying, don't trust this person, trust this person, don't trust mm. this person. I mean, it, it's, it was an unhelpful, unnecessary com- uh, comment in what was a very important message. Don't, you know, withdrawing your money from super should be a last resort. That is a great message. Why, why confuse that message? Oh, by the way, if you're thinking about that, don't talk to a financial advisor. Um, yeah, they can't be trusted effectively is what Choice said. Yeah. I do not see the motive in that. I think it's doing the consumer. I mean, if Choice is supposed to be Choice, it's giving people the choice. The choice as to whether they want to access and pay for advice, the choice whether they want to go to a financial counsellor, or the choices whether they want to manage them themselves. That's what choice is about. hundred yeah. percent. It was super annoying. Um, mate, thank you for your time today. Thanks for covering a bunch of the things that AFA have been recently doing. Um, yeah, I, I, I will, I will press if anyone has any suggestions as to how they feel that we can help to communicate to the government or regulators to help them. Um, and help their clients in the current environment, uh, please feel free to give us uh, feedback. Awesome. Mate, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, and you're on LinkedIn, I'm sure. You know, people yep. can uh, connect with you there, keep up to date as well. Absolutely. Awesome. Great to hear. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Clayton. Take care.